Hello and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. It is absolutely delightful to say these words to you, coming to you live. No, uh, you need to have powerful words when you say it. it's absolutely delightful to have these words coming to you. And I have nothing delightful to say. I do have something uh, I've been interestingly pondering, which is um, we have a tendency to look back at our lives and maybe your life i don't look back on your life because that would be interesting which a lot of people do uh which would be in annoying in some way when they look back and they make uh, certain uh, observations they pass judgment uh, they say things like oh when you were young my god man i'm surprised that you're here today man when you you were crazy back then or man i'm surprised that you turned out the way you are right now or, like dude Looking at what you were, I had no hope for you. I was so scared for you. I was so worried what would become of you. Um, because it's so easy. It's so easy to pass these comments when it doesn't have to do with you. When it means looking at other people's, whatever it may be, the path that they went down, the decisions they took, the behavior they adopted, the mannerisms they displayed, the, 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 the shit they got up to. And it's so much easier for you to look at that archive and say, you know what, I'm just going to sit and put this person under the mic, not even the microscope, maybe just under the spotlight, because it's easier than looking at my uh, past decisions and my past experiences and my journey so far. But in either case, whether it's you looking back at your life or you looking uh, collectively at someone else's past, which a lot of people are doing now um, by going back to someone's past decisions to take up projects or past comments on issues at that time in society and as a result passing collective judgment saying how dare they. Uh, I recently read somewhere that people want to, I think in, the, in, in France or somewhere, or the UK decided to do this where the publisher decided to edit Roald Dahl's certain novels uh, because certain ideas were offending people or certain words like Mark Twain's books were asked to be edited because of certain words. But you got to understand, they wrote in that point and it's very easy to look back and say how wrong these people were and their ideas were so backward for the time. There's the statement, backward for the time. It's not the time, it was that time. It wasn't backward for the time. That was the time and that's what these authors reflect. They didn't write about the future and that's called science fiction or it's called fiction when you kind of put forth an idea of what if living in a time which is now. Or uh, some people can go back in history and manipulate that when they write historical fiction and they take historical facts and they add their own story to it, which is total creative liberty, which is fucking brilliant. Now, let's get back to this. The thing is, when you look back at life, which is all the things you did, there is a sense of making a, I wouldn't say a, 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 a making peace with it, but you, you kind of look at whatever happened whether it is good or bad, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's positive or negative, these are all sort of same um, yet different ways of kind of taking stock of where you were. And you sit here today and you have these statements like hindsight is twenty twenty, and you rationalize or you justify or you recognize or you celebrate how these things happened to you and turned out um, maybe for the good, in which case you're like, wow, thank God. Or you say for the bad, like, shit, my life really sucked and I really uh, was dealt raw cards. But I don't know if this statement of hindsight being 2020 is really 2020 in that way because it's always the person who looks back. I'm saying now let's look at the individual looking back at their own life, putting things in context which suits their narrative at this point in time. Now, if things didn't work out, then you kind of put it in that narrative saying, oh, you know, this is because um, I was I was in these situations which dealt which resulted in these consequences, which then I had to deal with. Therefore, I am in this situation and I, I, I really am the victim of what happened to me. But on the flip side, if things did go badly uh, or, or things went well uh, and you are in a place of, say, success or in a place of happiness, then you say, you know what? It was all for a reason. Everything happened for a reason. And 
I'm playing both sides of the coin here because, you know, sometimes when I look back, I mean, I couldn't have asked for what I did. Yes, I can now look back and say, Ooh, what a ride. But is it right or wrong to say, you know, it's 2020 because it didn't make sense at the time and it shouldn't have made sense at the time because that's what life is, right? If you know how at that point in time everything makes sense and there's clarity, then it's boring. And some people try to do that through control. Everything in their uh, planning has to be a certain way to go down a certain path. And that's, well, all fine if that's your nature, but it doesn't really end up working that way. It doesn't pan out for everyone like that because life, if you want to call life as a thing, uh, doesn't really do that for you. But take life out of this. Just say this is a person's journey and this is how so many moving parts in society work at the same time. There's absolutely no way you can even look back and say this all happened for a certain reason or things worked out the way they should have or shouldn't have because everything is applied to what you're feeling today. And at that point, what you did was what you were feeling at that point. Good or bad, I'm just telling you from what I think that it's it's good maybe if you, if, if it gives you a sense of you know what gr- gratitude or appreciation for what you've lived but i think the biggest thing i'm trying to understand here and not sort of go in circles around is this idea of recognizing that you know what whatever happened to you happened to you and there were certain people involved there were certain um institutions depending on your college or work or whatever it may be there were certain um trends there were certain uh maybe parts of life that were bigger than you and that framed where you were and what happened to you and what you did as a result. So you can't really take away from all those things and just say, you know what, it's so clear what happened and why it happened and why I am where I am. But I think just recognizing that, you know what, that time in your life was that time in your life and it may reflect and it may show up in certain parts of who you are today but it doesn't mean that you have to be so defined and saying it was so clear why it happened the intervention that it did that did take place when it had to was so important to become to, to, to shaping me into the man or the woman or whatever I am today on the flip side to that there is this idea of learning from the past past experiences shaping the decisions that you take today and I think that is something which you can Uh, take stock of because you know what when you did certain things in the past yes of course I mentioned there were environmental social ideas which were framing the the opinions at the time of the at at that that time or it was the 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 the, the demand of the day let's call it that you had to be a certain um, thing you had to do certain things that were acceptable maybe certain things that were rivaling that acceptance and being rebellious but now the framework has changed but it's those it's those beyond the actual action but it's those things that gave you the power to deny or to plow through or to be resilient or to challenge or to to recognize and appreciate and collaborate those things i think can translate through and can transcend let's not say translate but transcend through various frameworks various times various days various ages that you are living through because the 90s framework the 2000s the 2020s these are all different frameworks but these tools or these emotional um uh, these 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 ideas of emotional maturity these ideas of emotional resilience i think that can help you get through any time and that way you don't have to justify or validate saying this is what happened and that's why it happened and therefore i am who i am but it can kind of keep you fluid through changing times changing people changing expectations changing narratives and yeah that's my that's what i feel helps as opposed to thinking of things in a static way, thinking that this has happened and it's over and it's a new chapter. And maybe in some sense it is, but the world isn't static in any sense, right? Uh, you can't go and take away certain words that people said and expect the world to be right today. Um, you can't expect to confine a person's way of thinking to something that suits only a small group of people and expect the resulting art or the resulting dialogue or the resulting discourse to be something which is ideal uh, and as a result resulting in a perfect society because that's not how it fucking works. Anyway. My guest on today's episode is someone who actually talks about this because he is a behavioral psychologist. He's an alumni distinguished professor of psychology at Virginia Tech with over 50 years of experience teaching. He's also a co-founder of Actively Caring for People. That's um, the group which he's formed. It's Geller AC4 
not for four p um and I really had a fascinating conversation conversation with Dr. Geller because he has really put in his life's work into understanding human behavior all the way from the seventies till today he has looked at the various kinds of changes in the way human behavior be, human behaves human beings interact they how human beings look at the idea of belonging the idea of moving forward progress all these things which are questions we ask ourselves today and i really liked his inputs because he's seen the change from a pre-internet era to the digital era we live in the 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 idea of how people are feeling disconnected people are feeling isolated people are harming themselves are creating these bubbles for themselves and having this idea of i am right and they are wrong and also another thing that we talk about is this 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 era of not being able to express and as a result um resulting in violent act, acts gun, gun violence suicide and there's so much i wanted to ask him and i got few of the questions in which i kind of confused myself with but really really insightful um gentleman who really gave me a lot of context and gave me a lot of insights into the human mind the human behavior because someone like him who has been through such changing environments is someone who can give you a sense of the past or give you a sense of where we are and give you these tools that he has seen that has helped human beings get through certain times that could be adverse trying how to sort of draw a sense of balance with yourself and also in some situations help you motivate yourself and towards that effort he talks about the four Cs which i think will really keep you interested and reflect on where you are and how you might be able to apply that in your day-to-day life anyway before i ramble on i want to hand it over to dr scott geller and Hey, this guy who hosts him on his podcast it happens to be Sophie Rao so I'll leave it to them and I'll leave it to you to enjoy listening to this episode as always I appreciate you listening tuning in every week till next time goodbye god bless take care of yourselves cheers Dr Scott Geller thank you so much for uh taking the time to join me on this podcast my pleasure my pleasure sandeep my pleasure to be here it's a very interesting time to have someone uh with your vast experience joining me talking about something which i think is a very urgent issue which is a sense of disconnection that people are going through and as a result the ability for uh large institutions large networks to kind of make them feel isolated and as a result manipulate them uh, what is your experience um shown you and the work you do shown you about the fragmentation of society and why it's almost become that it's become quicker and it's almost snowballing into something out of control well yeah and you know and covid the covid 19 didn't, didn't help us much either it, it kind of isolated us I mean, let's face it, psychologists have shown that people need each other. The best way to heal from grief, for example, is social support, interacting with others. But in our country, in the U.S., we're becoming very self-serving. And I think the social media has something to do with that. We're out for ourselves. And people watch social media, and it's more negative than positive. so we're watching the negative interactions between people rather than the positive interactions between people and it it's not it's not necessarily that that's the way it really is but that's what we see mm. i've seen it at my university for example i've been at my university for 53 years 53 years at virginia tech mm. and years ago i mean years ago 
we didn't we didn't have cell we didn't walk around with a cell phone in our hands talking we we talked with other people we interacted with others but now we're kind of in our own little world you know punching buttons we we don't even watch traffic anymore we look at our cell phone you know so it's a different culture it's a different right. culture and I, I can't blame people it's the culture that's influenced that at our Virginia Tech campus, we used to be a, a real community, a community of caring, a community of reaching out, a community of connectedness. And it's not that way today, not as it was years ago. And but I'm doctor, wondering if, isn't yes. culture the people or is people the culture? Like, isn't that a kind of the same thing? Because doesn't culture represent the people or is it the other way around? Oh, it, it's both ways. But mm. I guess my point is, I really can't blame an individual student yeah. for spending their time with their, I mean, I can't, because our culture has developed this kind of separation. In our country, for example, you've probably seen that the Democrats versus the Republicans. I mean, yeah. politics has just grown proportion. And you know what's going on with that? Mistrust. Who do you trust anymore? How many emails I get, which are people selling me something, and I don't know if I believe it anymore. That's a change in our culture. We don't know who to trust because we become more self-serving, clearly out for ourselves. And I'm not claiming that we've always cared about ourselves. Hmm. I mean, let's face it. We, we were controlled by consequences. We do what we do for what we expect to get for doing it or what we expect to avoid by doing it. However, we can have a community perspective. In my TED Talk, I talk about three C words that reflect self-motivation. And I might also say they reflect happiness or subjective well-being, what we call it. I teach positive psychology, which is what makes people happy. And there's, there's three words that I talk about on my TED Talk, one word is community. There's, they start with the letter C, community. When we feel a sense of interdependence in our country, we have this declaration of independence. Mm -hmm. Can I help you? No, I'll do it myself. No, we need to get interdependent. That's community. Another C word is competence. Believing that you're competent at doing worthwhile work. Now, how do you know if you're competent at doing worthwhile work? If somebody tells you, if somebody gives you supportive feedback. But if we don't have these interactions going, I'm not hearing whether I'm that I'm competent. And, and the, so that's one C word. And the other C word is choice, the perception of choice. We could talk an hour on or more on the value of believing and understanding how much choice we have every day. Anyway, those those, those are my words for self motivation, but they, they also connect to happiness. But what I want to understand is what is happening to the human being on an individual level? Yes, you mentioned the idea of mistrust, and that's such a scary premise to start the day with, right? That I don't know if what I am hearing what I'm reading, who I'm meeting is um, something I can trust or is someone who's out to get me and who's someone who's going to kind of de deplace me from my existing position, whether it's at work, whether it's in the, in the, in the supposed um, social standing I have online. And, and what does that do to you? Like uh, yeah, you, you mentioned the idea of disconnection, independence and self-satisfaction and self uh, preservation, but over a course of time, what does that do to a society? What does it do to a group of people? How does it shape what they become? Well, that's a brilliant question. What it does, it who can I trust? Just myself. I mean, we've had in our country, we, we don't went into politics, but we we've had politicians who just don't tell the truth. Mm. And they lie over and over, not only Paula, but we, my point is that that's broadcasting over television, over social media. So the bottom line is, who, and, and who do we trust? And I get scam messages all the time, people wanting me 
And by the way, it's this social media that's giving people opportunities to try to sell people on their ideas. It's not, it's not science, it's pop psychology, which disturbs <laughs> me greatly, you know? There's there's a science of psychological of psychology. There is there is, but who do we believe in anymore? Who do we listen to? And, and yes, yeah, so your your question is powerful because what happens if I can't trust others? I'm really going to become more independent. Mm. Only one I can trust is me or my family. So we 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 we, we pull away from society, pull away from others. And that's scary because I end my TED talk with we need each other and we do, you know, social support is critical for happiness, for subjective well-being. And my concern is we're losing that, at least in our country. What about your country? In our country, we're losing it. You know, it's it's very interesting to compare the two situations, right? Because I just got back from a friend's wedding and I overheard some people talking and the guy said, you know, I live in a joint family where we had four families living together. And that was the way. Uh, and if not four families, it was um, at least the siblings and the parents um, and the grandparents and say once the kids get married, it's their families who join. So it it, it is a group of people beyond just the nuclear family, if you want to call it. But that's changing. We have. Uh, I grew up. I grew up, and I continue to live in a big city, and a city which has uh, seen a lot of de development, progress, whatever you want to call it. But that, as a result, has encouraged a lot of people moving here for work. A lot of people um, who are attracted to investment, as you as you've observed in the U.S. Any big center of commerce gets a lot of people. But um, as a result, there is a lot of what you have said that is happening, which is the independence, the the lack of trust, the them versus us, they are not one of us, the 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 need to kind of hold on to, oh, this is my culture, this is my language, this is me, and that is who you are, and you're kind of taking away that from us, and a lot of the conversation around that, a lot of lot of tension around that, and India historically obviously has had a lot of tension when it comes to religious tension, but you see a lot more geographical tension the north indians versus the south indians or at least online and there's a lot of my language versus your language but and um it wasn't as predominant because when i grew up in bangalore it was not so um obvious right in the sense people didn't care they didn't care where you were from it was a lot more easy going it was a lot more oh you know what you're a friend and then you look at what they're family is or what their religion is. But now I feel that is becoming in some way a lot of the defining points. And I want to ask you a question about online. See, because the case for online social networks is that, hey, it takes away from the physical, but what it does do is give someone who is shy, someone who does, doesn't typically fit into, say, a school group or a um, other physical group, but it gives them the opportunity to reach out to people like themselves um, around the world where the, and people make a case for that when it's say people who are um, you, you know, gay or people who are lesbians in a community that, that doesn't accept them. So how, how would you um, uh, address that issue? Well, several things. Number one, everybody wants to feel important. Mm -hmm. You want to feel important. And I think these these text messages that we send all over interacting with lots of people enables us to feel important you yeah. know people know me you know i got followers i got a thousand plus followers following me man i'm important but we've done some research recently where we've measured screen time that is how much time are students spending on their talking with others with their over the internet and Guess what we found? Extroverts spend more time than introverts. So what I'm saying is even if you're not shy and you interact comfortably with others, you're still spending more time on your computer mm -hmm. interacting with others. Let me tell you some research we did recently. For example, we have marked sidewalks on our campus mm -hmm. where Vehicles have to stop 
and let the pedestrian cross the road. Yeah. Now, years ago on our campus, if a pedestrian crossed the road, they would turn and thank the driver. A simple statement of gratitude. Thank you. Not today. Mm. Not today. They're either in they're their own selves. We we have that data on that. We measured what's the pr- prediction? What's the percentage of pedestrians, students and faculty who simply while they're crossing the road turn and acknowledge the car for stopping for them? What do you think the percentage is? What what would it be in your country when how, what's the percentage? Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't I think people observe pedestrian crossings very, very carefully here. We have a little different rule of the road over here. But um, okay. I, I can I can compare Wait. it to something else, though. You know, like, for instance, th- there is a lot of, I wouldn't say it's gone, but humans looking out for humans, like, we have a lot of people in India, and as a result, there's a lot of chaos on the streets. There's a lot of lack of discipline when it comes to um, driving. There's a lack of etiquette. But, for instance, if a guy or a lady or anyone falls off a bike, other people will help. Um, and it's surprising how we we get by it with our lack of traffic discipline because it for anyone outside India, I wouldn't even say anyone from the US, anyone else, it is chaotic uh, and a bit overwhelming at times but it does manage I feel because see, there is lack of infrastructure there is lack of um, um, certain other kind of maybe rules when it comes to driving training but it, it, it gets by because people at some level um, recognize that there are other people uh, because you, you you'll see people on um, on on bikes on scooters that are a mother, a father, and three children. And that's just not safe by any standards, right? But it, it is the case. It is what it is. Um, so, so to address your, th- your question, but do, do people acknowledge? I, I, it's hard to say because there are people who do, uh, but there are also people now who are just so caught up because they are working a nine-hour shift at an IT, IT company or they're working at a job. They spend two hours going there and two hours coming back. So that's nine plus four, 13 hours. Now they're exhausted. Do they have the time to care? Um, but no, they don't sometimes because they're on their phone and or they're just so eager to just get by that they do whatever it takes to get past that traffic light and get back home. So they, you, and this is something you'd find interesting um, because you mentioned the footpath study. There are people in Bangalore, outside my house, in fact, to avoid the traffic jam in front of them, you have bikes going on the footpath they're driving on the footpaths riding past pedestrians so they don't really care if you want to ask me my honest opinion so you have people using the footpath as a road to get past traffic uh, congestion so i don't know what you well, make of on that our, <laughs> on our campus which is not that crowded yeah we have people walking we have cars we have scooters we had bicyclers um and it is it is a dangerous situation but mm. my point is all you have to do is turn and thank somebody. It's less than 10% right now. That's crazy. Years ago, it was 100%. You would see people acknowledging. Now, the word gra- gratitude, interpersonal gratitude, mm. is an important concept to think about. Just thanking somebody. That can develop a culture of gratitude, of, of connectedness. But the fact is, our data shows that that's falling away. The fact that less than 10% don't, that, that they, I'm entitled. The word that we use in our country now is entitled. I'm entitled. Of course, in our country, the, the marked sidewalk, the pedestrian has the right of way. But it doesn't mean you don't appreciate that some vehicle has stopped for you to let you grow. And it takes no time to just turn and say, thank you. That's all. Just a wave. But all I'm saying, I'm using that as an example for how our culture has becoming less interdependent and more self-serving on so their doc, own. They're not even thinking of showing gratitude. So, Doc, I want to I wanna focus a little bit on this word entitlement because there is a sense of people who are in their head or in their opinion or in their 
effort, they think they're doing the right thing, right? They're like, I'm undoing systems that were, 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 were marginalizing or systems that were enforcing a certain belief that is not what I am. And there's a lot of narratives around that. A lot of, And one thing I keep hearing is, or rather, I get a sense of this, I deserve this. I um, am entitled to my opinion. I'm entitled to my beliefs. I'm entitled to, um, to, to feel a certain way about a certain group. What, what does that create um, when not just one individual, but multiple inv individuals believe that they are entitled? What does that create for a group? Well, one, it creates a lack of appreciation of others, right? It, it yeah. also stifles, it stifles a social connection. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it stifles, by the way, here's another big word that I think we're losing in our country, empathy, mm -hmm. which relates to your point. Empathy means that I understand or I attempt to understand where the other person is coming from. I'm crossing the road. Empathy means that person has stopped their car to let me pass. I should at least show some appreciation for that. But again, we're not thinking empathy requires considering the other person. Mm. And I believe that we're, we're falling behind on that, at least in our culture, in our country, we're falling behind on that. And some of it is fueled by the negativity over the internet. The negative stories of again this lack of trust mm -hmm. so i don't feel a connection with other people so i'm on my own me and my family and you tie that up and i think that's such a uh key thing to observe in today's day and age it's the most we've ever had right it's the most number of options choices as you mentioned earlier um, and especially in, in the, in, in the U S it's, it's, it's a very good life. I'm of course not making a blanket statement across groups of people. There are people going through hardship, but, um, as, as a collective, as, as human beings, there is the, the time we live in, there's a lot of things. I mean, yes, of course, there's a lot of disparity and I'm not taking that away, but what, why is this abundance of choice, um, backfiring on us? Hmm. Well, we're obviously not not using the choice to interact with others. Can mm. I help you? I'll do it myself. Mm. But, you know, it, it's, we're, we're on our own. We feel like we're on our own. And that can be, um, that'd be tough. You know, we have a high rate of suicides these days. We have a, a high rate of unhappiness in, in, our, in our country. Yeah. We have a high, and I think a lot of that, is fueled by the perception of lack of social support, right. lack of trust, lack of interdependency. You know, again, we do need each other. A word I really like is the word synergy. What is mm. synergy? Synergy means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And the sum of the parts are people. And the more the more different, the more divergency you have among those people, the greater the synergy. But also the tougher it is to get the people to work together. Wouldn't giving yourself up for the whole involve some level of admitting or rather accepting and showing your vulnerability, which people are refusing to do nowadays? Oh, that's exactly right. Maybe that's that's the key. I if I for me to say, I can't do it all. My I need you. Mm. That could imply a weakness, mm. and that that could be that's a problem. It, it shouldn't imply weak. It should it it should imply strength. Mm. You know, working together. But your point is very very well taken. For some people, if I have to rely on somebody else. I'm not as independent as I should be. Yeah. And you know, that's the, that, that's such a, uh, you know, on a personal front, um, I was always, that was my goal, right? Not depend on people. I want to be independent because 
at the age of eight, I got diagnosed with Stargardt's disease, which is a form of macular degeneration. And my, in my head, that was a, uh, that was a negative. That was a, uh, a, a lack of strength. That was a weakness. And that was, um, I was operating from a place where I'm not good enough. And as a result, every, um, every decision or every act was determined by this, 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 this thought that you are not good enough. So you have to do something to be accepted, to be validated. You have to also mm -hmm. uh, do everything uh, that you can to be independent. Right. And uh, as a result, I was operating from such a scary place because uh, if it didn't work out in that way, in my thought process, I'm set back even more. And that just tires you, right? It, 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 it doesn't allow you to address the fact that you do need help. Uh, in certain things, but you can focus on other things that you can do. Um, and it took me years to get over that way of thinking. And what you're saying is just, um, I can resonate with that because you, you're you constantly scared, you're insecure, your worth is down the toilet. And <laughs> as a result, you, 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 you do things, for, you operate, if you want to use that word, from a very, um, um, what's the play, what's the word I'm looking for? You operate from a very uh, volatile place. And it's tiring, yeah. In, in my in my academic world, instead of working together collaboratively, we have our own individual silos. Mm. Each faculty member yeah. does their own independent research, and they have their own students, and they they get grant money, and so we we they have their own thing, and they they publish their articles, and yes, good stuff. But think how better it would be if we collaborated. The word we use these days is interdisciplinary. Yeah. Interdisciplinary. If we could get psychologists to work with engineers and work with biologists and work with chemists and come together, we're not doing that enough. We, we are, again, back to what you say. We promote this independence over interdependence. But w w the, there is, you know, a need for dependence. I think um, everyone has that, right? That's that's something that they might not accept or they might not be aware of, but there is the need to be wanted, belong to something. But as a result of this uh, lack of ability to, to sh sort of sh display your vulnerability or uh, the lack of trust, and you put all these ingredients in the mix and you have people who are... Um, who want to, to sort of come up uh, and then you have other people who want to manipulate. You, you have the emergence of a lot of these groups now, which are quote unquote cults that are um, kind of brainwashing people and across the board, right? You have it in the US, you have um, the, the, the terror groups, which do the same thing on a larger scale, on a more damaging scale. But I'm not in some way, damage is ob obviously relative, but it's also bad when someone who is, say, you know, a 25 year old uh, woman in America who's educated and suddenly she's a part of a cult where she's being abused. And so, so, so um, while community is so important, what happens if it heads down this path where people do feel, feel like they belong, but the, the whole is, is quite scary and the whole is doing damage to humanity see now you've raised a very very critical point i would we need to discriminate when do we join and when do we not i mean there mm. there is a time to be independent there is a time to say that cult that group is not consistent with my values I mean, mm. there's a time to do that but so now we're looking at the other side where people are drawn in to a group we we have that in politics in this country. We have we have people just joining a political group just to be part of that group. Mm. And that that's scary. That's the negative side of community, isn't it? The negative yeah. side of interdependence. Yeah. So how does because clearly to make that decision, it seems obvious to you and me that okay, you know what, listen to your values. Then, but many people can't. They, I don't say they can't. They they don't have values, but their values keep changing every day, like a hashtag. So how, how does someone like that, um, uh, who doesn't have a 
stable base to kind of face the world from, how, how does someone like that even choose? Or how does that someone like that even realize that they have other choices? Well, that, that's a great point. And of course, we're, I've been promoting this notion of actively caring for people, mm -hmm. that the value should be promote human welfare, right. care for others, help others. In other words, positivity, the positive side of, of people. But for me, that's a value. Right. And we can cultivate others to accept and appreciate that value. But again, there's, there's, we have other values that are just the opposite, that are quite negative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, conflict, um, white supremacy, and so on and so forth. Those are also values on the negative side with regard to human welfare. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in India for years, there is the um, a sense of responsibility, duty, and um, by virtue of not doing that, a sense of guilt to the community, right? Uh, and I speak beyond the family. I speak about, say, um, a social group, like, which is formed as a result of, you know, religion or, uh, uh, yeah, religion bringing them together or maybe caste in the past, right? Uh, so what would happen is people would um, think about what the group or the community would think of them before doing certain things. And this, in some ways... Uh, would have give up your dreams for the for the group or you you behave a certain way because um, the group con condones it or the group will be critical of it and for men and women as a result that was a it, it, it held the fabric together if you want to call it uh, good but as a result it has a lot of pent up frustration in uh, the people today because a lot of the the children of those people are like, I don't want to be like my parents because it was too much pressure to conform to this uh, sense of community and what they want from me. As a result, I want to be, and you, and you have a lot of that now with um, the modern Indian uh, man and woman where everything has sort of now come to them. It's like the, the curtain has been lifted, right? They have access to, say, on the entertainment front, the world with showcasing themselves on social media uh then they have the uh, the the, the um, money because of work they can go spend it they can travel they have uh sex drugs and rock and roll or hip-hop or whatever the music they choose um so with that mindset where i'm i'm free to along with these ingredients of my god they ha and we've gone in some ways straight from zero to hundred right we've skipped a lot of the other things that say people in the us or europe uh, went through and we've gone straight to um, now people like that people who were say typically in a more conservative community which would say women should not be doing this women should not work in this women should not wear this so men had that role of like, women should be a, a mother a wife to now those women uh, you know wearing hot pants or like clothes that are revealing online um, and saying you know screw it I don't want a conventional marriage I want maybe I'm I'm going to uh, experiment with the fact that I'm a lesbian or my, my, my sexuality is up in the air. So it's creating a lot of, I, I'm not saying any of this is good or bad. I'm just kind of giving you, painting a picture of what some of the things are happening here. Um, it's creating a lot of conflict, uh, a lot of, um, uh, I wouldn't say debate, but it's creating a lot of um, what you just said, the, the the independence leading to mistrust, leading to, um, I am better than someone and on a scale which is you know a population of India which is three times out of the US or maybe more so it's a bit it's a bit unnerving well yeah and see you're you're also talking about social influence yeah there's and one one word we is conformity mm -hmm. or or as Robert Cialdini calls it social proof mm -hmm. I want to fit in with the group so I will do what they are doing so I can fit and sometimes what they're doing is not necessarily positive not mm. necessarily beneficial to human welfare but yeah. I've joined this group we've known this for years what your group that you're in certainly influences your behavior and 
eventually of your values. Right. It's complex. But again, let's get back to what is your culture promoting? What is the overall viewpoint that parents are teaching their kids, that teachers are teaching their students? You know, what what are some of the lessons? I, I call them life lessons. What are the life lessons that we should be teaching others and spreading around? And one of those, one of those life lessons is uh, well, it, the three C's for one, community, choice, um, but also the sense of gratitude. By the way, there's interpersonal gratitude. That is showing somebody else that you're grateful. Yeah. But there's also yeah. intrapersonal gratitude, mm. talking to yourself about what you are grateful for. And that, of course, relates to positivity or human welfare. But I think my point is, <laughs> we it's 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 not easy to decide what do i do where do i what group do i join who do i trust as we said earlier who do i trust and and yeah. the group you join might have a great impact on your future behavior and that could be good or not so good even tragic yeah because you know if you look the group or the percentage of people I described when I mentioned the breaking away and the working, it's it's a it's a relatively small percentage. But now there's a huge middle class that is empowered, and there's a they're, they're setting free from the shackles, if you want to call it. And as a result, you have a lot more people who do have money. But of course, we still have a huge population. The big disparity in population are in who, who are who don't, who don't have good education. There's a lot of discrimination. There's a lot of poverty. Um, but this this word which you mentioned is, is kind of coming up to me right now because competence i feel is um is so important but i feel it's also very loosely held uh because people have a sense of importance that is i think more than what it what the reality is and as a result that creates this this false a value system for the ego and they're like oh i'm i'm better than the person next to me i make more than my neighbor and um i'm sensing this of course i'm not a, i'm not a sociologist or an expert in any way but i'm sensing this 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 um this energy right now with people where there's a lot of uh what you're describing and i think it's important to talk about it because it seems like we're in the footsteps of what this america did or the what american culture went through and maybe, you know, by you showing light and talking about it, maybe we, all of us don't have to uh, go down that path. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's decisions. Mm. For example, as you, you said, importance being what, what is importance? What defines a person with regard to their importance? For some, it's how much money you make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for others, for, for me, by the way, it's teaching and learning. Mm. I think it's important to have a perspective of always learning and teaching what you know. But that's my, that's my, of course, I, that's biased by my profession. So it's, it would be interesting to do a survey among people. What do they, what do they believe is important? Mm. Because what you believe is, is important that's what you strive. That's what you work for beyond right. handling your basic needs, food and shelter and sleep and so on. And status is such an important thing in, 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 in Indian community, right? How you, how you are seen by others. Of course, in many ways, it's a similar way we celebrity worship, but no one seems to look at how a person got there they, they, they don't seem to want to acknowledge the hard work it's only the outcome that people are looking to celebrate and to be envious of uh, so that is another strange thing right because everyone wants to be uh you know hailed as oh my god what a what a successful person and they jet set on their private yacht and their jet and they go everywhere but no one wants to look at the story behind it and 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 why is that because they want to look at the negativity of the person when they when they brought down they're like ah i told you so but why are we so drawn to 
negativity because it feels like negative thoughts can come so easily. But just to ha have and hold on to one positive thought, it takes us forever. We have to, we have to self-reflect. We have to be grateful within, as you said, intrapersonal gratitude. We have to meditate. We have to really, really squeeze out that positive thought. But the negative thought, the floodgates are always open. <laughs> Well, yes, and what does the media pay attention to? Negativity. Neg yeah, yeah. It's, negativity is what calls, get, gets our attention. In fact, I've written a book on parenting, and parents, guardians, often focus on the negative because mm. it's the negative that, that stands out. Instead, right. we should be focusing on positive. We should be We should be supporting the good stuff rather than quickly jumping on punishing the bad stuff. But, right. but anyway, that's a an whole other topic. But the point that you just made is, what is, why do we focus on the negative? Because that's what sticks out. And that's what the media, that's what gets our attention. Right. And maybe if somebody has a whole lot more than I, they, they have a, and I can see something negative about them, that may make you feel a little bit less envious of what they have. Mm. But that doesn't keep you, It, uh, you know, it, 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 it makes, like when someone does badly or someone fails or someone has a habit that is um, more um, kind of damaging to them than yours, you feel, yeah, you're right. I mean, absolutely. I, you're like, ha, ah, you know, like he smokes more cigarettes than me. Uh, you feel better for a while. But you don't feel good. You, you, you might, that thought might give you a sense of some kind of a, you know, like a satisfaction, if that's not even the right word. I think maybe a sense of like, I'm, I won. But over the course of time, that hurts it because you're not looking right. at yourself, then you're constantly looking at others to see whether they did more. And the moment someone else comes to you after and says, hey, I quit smoking, you feel like, oh my God, I lost. You know? Well, you're talking about social comparison. Yeah. We evaluate or we compare ourselves with others. Yeah. And we evaluate our self-esteem. Now, think about this. Our self-esteem is essentially what we think others are saying about us. Mm. What do others say about me? But self-esteem yeah. is also determined by me comparing my situation with others. Yeah. And if we see somebody who's done better than we have done, um, we one way to say is what what can I do to get there? What what how can I achieve what they have achieved? Yeah, yeah. But the other yeah, or now we look at the downside, we look at people who have not achieved as much as we have, and that can make us feel better, you know. So we can put ourselves down to, I haven't gotten as much as they have, but we can feel better by saying, I have more than, than they have. I mean, this is just, again, we're just talking about social comparison yeah. and, and understanding, evaluating our, our don't use that word again, our importance. How important am I? It's, it's, it's comparing it to other people. But back to what you said earlier, in our country, those those negative people, mm. those those liars. I mean, we've had we've had a we've had a recent trail trial on people, and it's been shown that very strong negativity, but they're getting a lot of attention. Yeah, it's the negative, the negative, the negative people get a lot of attention in our culture, and that's sad. We should be paying more attention to the people who are doing well, who are sending setting the positive example rather than the negative example. And the, I wouldn't say the sad thing, but the, the, the reality is that the ones doing real work, putting their head down are the, are the quiet ones. <laughs> they're not, you know, they're not standing on the top of building, shouting out saying, Hey, look at me, I'm doing positive work. They just, um, and, and as a result, it's harder to find them and to, to recognize them. But I, I got a sense of this, uh, when, when I, I wanted to make a shift in the way I looked at myself and how I, uh, in relation to that, looked at, you know, the community around me and what I was doing and why I was doing that, I felt there was a need for me to disconnect before reconnecting. Uh, how, how do you, 
um, I mean, how, say that how again. Dis- I had to say disconnect this- from this- the, the, the kind of uh, setup I had, uh, the way I was talking to people, the way I was talking to myself, the thought process. I had almost to, to, to find what meant and what was important to me and to recognize that and value that I almost had to take a step back. I had to disconnect from the way I was living to reconnect um, in a way that was uh, giving me a sense of uh, looking at myself with a different kind of perspective. And that I, it, it took a little bit of hard work, you know, because to recognize that I was competent, to recognize my community, to recognize my choices, I had to step away from the way I used to live. And that was important and rewarding, but it's also something that needs support to do. And, uh, you know, what would you, what would you say about that? Well, I say, excellent. That's what therapy is about. That's Mm. what counselors do. That's Mm. what, that's, that's really the thing about therapy is having a person step back and evaluate themselves with, with particular set of values And, and good for you that you were able to do that yourself. We, we all ought to do that once in a while and step back and, and how am I? How am I doing? You know, it's, you know, Stephen Covey wrote this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm-hmm. And his main point is, what do you want them to say at your funeral? Yeah. When you're gone, what, 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 what are you going to leave behind? What, what have you done to make the world a better place? He didn't say it that way, but that's how we could think about it. What, what do you want them to say? And yeah. again, that's stepping back and kind of evaluating. And sometimes we have to make some changes if we, if we really want to turn in the direction of, I use the word positivity, a yeah. pot make the world a better place. What does it take to do that? You know, someone said that the biggest, one of the biggest industries in the 21st century uh, going forward now is going to be mental health. Um, and that is uh, already scaring me because the way they said it, it almost was like an investor saying, hey, this is where I'm going to put my money. And um, I know the importance of going to therapy and how important a good therapist is, but more important than that, finding the right bond and not just listening to what they have to say and then going out and spouting it saying, yeah, this is what I think anxiety is a problem and depression. And because sometimes in these cases, saying the words is not as the same as feeling it and taking a step back. Um, what, I mean, if, you know, if you have a group of people who are openly admitting that they need help and going and getting help, I think it's good. But do you see a flip side to that um, when it becomes profitable to invest in mental health? Well, the first thing to say is, if you have a physical problem, you go to a doctor, mm-hmm. right? And you go to a particular kind of a doctor. You know, I, I had a cold. I go to a particular kind. I, I dentist. I go to a particular kind of a doctor. Yeah. When it comes to psychotherapy, first, people are resistant to go for their mental health, right? Mm. I mean, so people, physical health, yeah, cool. But I, I don't want to admit that I'm crazy and of course that's a bad word i don't want to admit that my mental health is not good and then if i do admit it okay i need some counselor what kind of therapy do i go to Mm. so again there's basic ignorance with regard to what kind of therapy could help me let alone the fact that very few people relatively few people own up to the fact that they need some therapy, <laughs> yeah. no problem. I mean, I'm not embarrassed to go to a doctor, a physical doctor, a yeah. dentist, ears, but to go to a therapist, a psychologist. So there is kind of a negative connotation with with mental health therapy, and that's got to change. Right, that needs to change because many of us could benefit by some some counseling, as you said, just stepping back and reevaluating. How am I doing? Do I like myself? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. Because, you know, fortunately, um, some people have a support system, uh, which, you know, I think it happens through whether family or close friends or you you, went, you had the 
um, I, I would call it maybe the, the privilege or maybe the foresight to create that system for, for yourself. But um, more, more and more we see people, uh, as we've spoken already, feeling fragmented from uh, even their families. Like a lot, lot, lot of parents feel um, that, you know what, I don't know my kid. Like, oh yeah, you know, uh, I know who he is or who she is. But there's such a vast sort of gap even across the dining table when the, the, the kid doesn't want to it kind of sort comfort or um, confide in his or her parents. But, you know, then as a result, when things do go um, spiraling out of control, or not, not even that bad, but when things start going down the route of negativity, negative thoughts, negative consequences, how do you take a step back? Because I, 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 I just something that, is so important going forward because to recognize that um, the, the, I need to belong to a group or to take these steps, whether it's for yourself to start with and then extending yourself out into uh, society to find a community, it, it involves a fundamental sense that I've got, my, I've got, someone's got my back. I mean, that's not there. How does someone even face this decision? Well, let's get back to the word you used, support system, support group. Mm -hmm. Who is your support group? And are they well-defined? Right. These days, it used to be family. It mm -hmm. used to be my family. But now with, with the media, with, with social media, <laughs> it's all over the place. I could, mm -hmm. I could find my social group with some, some TikTok Situation. I mean, I'm, I'm right. saying that we're yeah. we're not interact. It's not a. It's not interpersonal anymore. It's it's internet. So that's the other thing. And 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 so maybe maybe we're losing that sense of connectedness with other people at times. Um, so so going forward, what would you say are some of the key things? Uh, I think you mentioned them, but. Uh, what are some of the key things that an individual can do for um, him or herself, but also take that forward to um, people they might want to connect with or um, form a, a bond with? Um, because this, this is across the board from someone trying to find a sense of, of, of belonging to a sense of peace in their own space to even the way people are dating, the way people are looking at relationships with uh, romantic relationships or relationships for longevity. Everything's taken a hit because, you know, I, I kind of get a gauge from people. They're like, yeah, dating, I, you know, I, I fortunately uh, I'm with someone and I, I get a sense of uh, belonging with her and we have a family. But there are a lot of people now who are lost even when it comes to trying to find a partner because there are so many things uh, that are um, difficult to to kind of to, 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 to bring to the table when you're having a conversation with someone for the first time um, that everyone's got their guard up. Everyone feels like they have to kind of dominate the conversation. And that's a very hard way to go forward. So for someone right now who's maybe listening, saying, you know, I'm single, I want to find someone or someone who says, I feel a little lost, I want to belong to something beyond me. What are some of the uh, steps they can take? And just to add another point to that, what will these groups in the future look like with um, the communities? What could they possibly resemble with the world only getting stronger and stronger with technology influence, with the internet in the influence of the internet and with everything seemingly moving online. <laughs> I wish I had an answer to that. I mean, really, you know, I've been on this earth for a long time and, and I, um, and you know, now, now we have, we have artificial intelligence. Mm. Now, in fact, the challenge is I don't have to write a paper on my own anymore. Yeah. I can go to the chat link and, and, Tell them what to write for me. So yeah. it's yeah. it's a different world. It, it's a different world. We we're gonna we're we're wonder what is creativity anymore, you know? Mm. And but that's another topic. Yeah. How, how to you know, now people are using the internet to find partners, to yeah. to, to develop relationships, as as we know. And it, that's 
who knows? That can make, might be a very positive way to do it. I mean, I, I don't have any answer for the, the inter. I think, but the philosophy we, I think we have to develop is we need each other and mm. we need to respect diversity. I mean, we need to realize that if I have a team that, re, that has different opinions, different ideas, different perspectives, we bring those together and we get synergy. But it takes longer to do that. It's here's an in, a story. Let's say we have a problem, a problem in our con, in our company. Uh-huh. The way to solve the problem quickly is a manager defines the problem to the team and says, "This is our problem. Let's solve this problem." And starts to assign different parts of the problem to be solved by different individuals. Right. That's one way. But that's not the most effective way. That's efficient, but not the most e- the most effective way. We have a problem. What do you guys think are possible solutions to this problem? Mm. That might take a long time to get these people to come forth with their ideas. And then guess what? What should we do with these ideas? It's going to take longer. Yeah, it's yeah. not a quick fix. So my, I think my point is, this the solutions might be the same as a top-down directive versus the interactive consensus building. We might come up with the same solution, but in which situation will the people be more self-motivated, feel more engaged? Here's that word again, feel more choice. I help to choose, to select what we're doing. My, my point is, and some of these concepts we're talking about here today, like choice, like interdependency, like synergy, like belongingness, it's not a quick fix. Yeah, It takes time, even the word empathy, <laughs> to, yeah. to really stop and consider what the other person is thinking. That takes time. And we don't, and if, if anything, these days, we don't have enough time to do anything anymore. <laughs> my my colleagues at, at the university, we I, I don't have time to interact. Mm. I don't have time for interdisciplinary collaboration. I got to do it myself to do my publications, to get my tenure and my pr- promotion. I mean, again, the world is becoming more and more independent. I'm no, I'm no I'm redundant rather than interdependent. And maybe it's all about which is faster, mm. which is more efficient. You know, you've, uh, just before we um, wrap up for the for the day, um, you've spent 53 years in this field and clearly you've seen a lot of things in the world around you, but also in your field changing. And that shows that, of course, you're someone who's um, able to kind of, keep up with change uh, and also keep uh, fluid through a, a rapidly or slowly changing times. So what has helped you um, be um, kind of, I would say, centered, but also help you cope with uh, so many things that have changed over the past 53 years in your career? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> One word is flexibility. Mm-hmm. You got to be flexible. You got to be willing to change, to modify according to the situation. Um, what I do, which very few professors do, uh, before I send in an article for publication, mm-hmm. I give it to my students to give me feedback. Oh, nice. That is, okay. I have my students tell me what they think of my written expression. And, mm. and my point is, I've always kind of been that way, kind of been open to get opinions and ideas from other people. I I really think I do try to buy, I buy into synergy. I buy into inclusion. I buy into diversity. And and maybe maybe that's what I've had to do. And I tell my students right now, they are much smarter than I am. (laughs) Their intelligence is much higher than mine. In fact, my brain is starting to shrink. Okay. But what I have to offer is I know psychological science. 
I mean, I've interacted with the heroes in our field, like B.S. Skinner, for example. I mean, they, I've, I've interacted with them. And so I know I have my knowledge here, but that's not enough. I learn as much from my students in, in, in many ways as they do from me. And together, we, we do research and we do scholarship. I have right now, I have 50 undergraduate students doing research and all of our research is attempting to improve behavior to to better to better human welfare whether it's whether it's saving environmental resources whether it's increasing interpersonal gratitude or happiness all of it is about how can we help people do the right thing for human welfare on a large scale. That's brilliant because I think it's so important and it's so, you know, necessary that um, people like you are doing the work that you're doing because it, it, it's such an essential thing, behavior, and we, we kind of seem but, to focus on other things and say, you know, but. Um, but the, I'm going to say one, I need to say one word. Yes, please. One word, dissemination. Mm. I've been frustrated much of my career because we know science psychological science that could make the world a better place but the world is not paying attention mm. we're not getting the word i mean there's pop psychology out there there's mm. the internet that people are getting their information from sources other than science and for me it's better very frustrating and why i appreciate what we're doing here today is Maybe some of this stuff will will stick. My my TED talk. I'm proud of that because that's 15 minutes on motivation. That's not popular. That's not pop psychology. It's based on science. It's based on research. And that must be um, quite um, disheartening sometimes when you're doing all this work. You've got your students who are putting in hours, doing good research, and then you have some influencer who's uh, coming up on uh, social media on an Instagram reel talking about um, you know her opinion or his opinion on what motivation is or what anxiety is or what self-worth is and you're going oh none of that is true <laughs> oh you're so right my friend it's so frustrating for me to see that yeah it's it's my it, it's very frustrating in, in fact it's Again, one of one of the areas I've been working in is is safety and mm. helping people keep others safe. Yeah. And I hear such wrong stuff from the internet, and it's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. But again, shows like yours, when you get get people to talk about the science or data, when when someone gives me their opinion, I say, "You got data? Mm. You know, you know, there's a lot of opinion out there, yeah. but." What, what what's the data got data no which is essential because a friend of mine made this observation he's a psychiatrist and uh, over, uh you know over the course of the um, the lockdown there were people popping up on these social media groups saying oh you know community for anxiety and none of them were um therapists or counselors or psychologists or psychiatrists they were just people who went through it and were saying oh you know what come here and we can um we can help you deal with your anxiety. So he said, you know what, it, maybe as they can, they can kind of support each other, but it's dangerous because, you know, when, when, the, when they can't handle it and something happens to that individual, um, who's going to be accountable? And accountability is something which I feel is another thing missing uh, when it comes to opinions. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and again, back to our earlier comment, who do you trust? Yeah. I mean, who do I trust anymore? I'll tell you what's what's disappointing. Sometimes it's who has the best delivery. Mm. It's not the best knowledge, but who can deliver it best? You know, right. who can? And and so that's the person who wins over getting over the the situation, whether they kind of soft spoken, um, boring scientist who speaks in language that I don't quite understand. Yeah, we're not getting it. 
But the pop psychologist out there <laughs> who screams and shouts and jumps around, they're the ones who, who influence to a greater extent than they should. And that's scary. Yeah. That's, that's very scary. Um, yes. Uh, it's, Doctor, you spoke it, about your active caring initiative. Can you uh, just say a few words about that before we wind up for today? Oh, I'd love to do that. We we had a shooting tragedy. You know, it is an interesting a shooting tragedy is oh hum another shooting strategy. But yeah. When we had ours back in two thousand and seven, it was it was rare. It was rare. And after that event, I have to tell you, people were reaching out, showing mm. caring. I've got more emails from people asking me if, if I am I okay. I mean. We really showed caring after the event. Mm. And the challenge is, how do we get proactive caring? How can we, can we get people to help others before we have these tragedies? By the way, the shooter at Virginia Tech, like some of these other shooters, he was a loner. Mm. He did not have social support. He went to his classes wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses. He didn't have a group. He lived with two other roommates who paid no attention to him. So he didn't have a sense of belongingness, as you indicated earlier. He didn't have that. So he developed his sense of control by killing 32 faculty and students. Oh, good. You know, and, and so anyway, my point is, what do we do about that? So my students, after that event, we came up. I'm wearing a wristband here. Mm. It's a green wristband, and it says actively caring for people. Mm. And every wristband has its own identification number. So the way this works, call it STEP, S-T-E-P, S, see an act of kindness. See somebody helping somebody else, doing something positive. Thank them. That's the T. See an act of kindness, T, thank them, give them this wristband and say this, I, I saw that behavior, that is actively caring. You know, we all care, mm. but we don't necessarily do something about it. And thus, the E of step, enter that, that positive exchange on the internet, ac4p.org. Check it out, AC, the number four, P.org and report that story. We have thousands of positive gossip mm. on that internet where people are talking about positive exchanges. And then, but guess what? The last letter is P, S T E, pass it on. Don't keep this wristband, but look for another act of kindness and pass it on. Now, I'm wearing a blue wristband. We have in our country now, we have police officers wearing a blue wristband mm. and they had their own web website actively caring for people policing so they go through the whole step process but imagine in our country we have a lot of negativity around here about police officers yeah it's it's a minority it's just a but that's the one that gets the attention yeah but the police officer sees an act of kindness gives the citizen this wristband Thank you for actively caring. Mm. Now go to our website and report this positive exchange. Guess what, though? When people, when citizens get a blue wristband from a police officer, they don't want to pass it on. They're mm. proud of this blue wristband. Man. Right. <laughs> so but the point is, that's, that's a process mm. using the Internet to promote positivity, positive acts of kindness. And again, another website is my name, Geller, A C number four P mm -hmm. dot org. We have several books. We have we have a book for parents that teaches the principles of actively caring for parents. We have a book for police officers, a book for school teachers, and a mm. book for college students. And again, it's all about dissemination. These books are based on science. The basic principle is promoting human welfare through our interactions with others. And again, this is just one way of getting the word out. And thank you for letting me 
talk about this and say a few things is maybe somebody will check out that website, ac4p.org. Absolutely. I'll put the links to both um, in, in, in the description. And um, I'm sure people who are listening now are definitely, um, like me, I think convinced that we need to take it up on our own and kind of spread the word amongst our friends and uh, the people we know, because these things, like what you just explained, it seems like quite a process, but it is required when you're facing so much of the opposite and the the overwhelming narrative being negative, being um, uh, being bombarded by the one percent or whatever the minority by the by the pop psychologists or the 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 um, person who doesn't have the data, it it needs to be um, uh, I think uh, visited yeah. from an uh, from a, from a, from a, from the from a step by step detail kind of thing because it it. it it, it is a lot of undoing to be done. Yes, and just start with just thanking people. Mm. Thank you. And it, like I'm thanking you. And then, by the way, that, that feels good from both sides. Yeah. When you give thanks, you feel better. And the person who receives, the beneficiary, feels better. We just need to be more appreciative, I think, of other people. Because we are all in this together to make the world a better place. That's really well said. And um, it's been such a pleasure doc, talking to you about um, this, this, this thing, behavior, which is such a crucial kind of point on which we can either change the direction in which we go or just keep slipping down the slope. And I really appreciate you taking the time, but I think on behalf of everyone listening, I think really appreciate you spending so many years of dedicated research and dedicated work in this field and um, sharing it with people of my generation, people of generations to come. So I really appreciate it and thank you. Thank you, my friend.